worship. Brother Rick, if you would come. Good morning. As you can see on our monitor to the rear, it discusses or has a depiction of POWs and MIAs. This week was POW MIA week. I don't know of anyone in this group who may have had a loved one who was a POW or MIA, but there are still several individuals missing because their bodies cannot be found or they'll say they're just in some encampment in Cambodia, Vietnam, and maybe some in Korea. So the governor of, the, of uh, South Carolina has issued a proclamation of sorts wanting us to recognize POWs and MIAs, and I think it's very fitting. And I have to say often, I thank Pastor Nail for allowing us to bring the issues of veterans to the forefront using this church as the foundation. Let's give him a hand, please. <clears throat> National POW MIA Recognition Day in the United States. The United States National POW MIA Recognition Day is observed across the nation on the third Friday of September. Each year, many Americans take the time to remember those who were prisoners of war and those who are missing in action. MIA, as well as their families. What do people do? Many Americans across the United States pause to remember the sacrifices and services of those who were, of those who were prisoners of, of war, POW, as well as those who are missing in action, MIA, and their families. All military installations by the National League of Families, POW MIAs, fly their flags at half staff which symbolizes the nation's remembrance of those who were imprisoned while serving in conflict and those who remain missing. Most often, you will see a POW MIA flag, which is depicted there, and you will see the U.S. flag on a staff, and it's called flown at half staff, I meaning it's halfway down. At the end of that observance, the flag will be re-raised, and I think that's very fitting background, there are 1,741 Americans, prisoners, issued by the, the Department of Defense that are still missing in action. Some come from World War, from the Vietnam War in 1975, 841 are still missing from the Vietnam War. About 90% of the 1,741 people still missing among the wars or loss in Vietnam, areas of Laos, Laos, Cambodia, under Vietnam's wartime control, according to the National League of Families who's, who cited, in, who cited in the United States America website. The United States Congress passed a resolution authorizing National POW MIA Recognition Day to be observed on July the 18th in 1979. It was observed on the same date in 1980 and was held July the 17th, 1981 and 82. It was then observed on April the 9th in 1983, July the 20th, and 1984. The event was observed on July the 19th and 1985. And then from 1996 onwards, the date moved to the third Friday of September. The United States president each year proclaims National POW Recognition Day. Many states in the U.S. also observe POW MIA Day recognition together with the national effort. That's not a national holiday, but it is a national observance for all of America. Thank you for your time, and if you see a service member Please tell them thank you for their service. God bless you and have a good day. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet today. Praise.
praise the Lord. Can we just put our hands together this morning and give the Lord praise? Come on, put our hands together. Hallelujah. Did you come to worship Him today? Amen. Somebody say, Jesus. Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's worship Him. voice this morning. He's the lion, he's the lamb. Hallelujah. 
in store. Hallelujah. We want to welcome you this morning to Lake City PH Church. We're so glad to have you. And if you're a guest in the house today, we just want you to feel loved and welcome. We are a family here. Amen. The family of God, brothers and sisters, and you are part of that family. Praise the Lord. Let's take a moment if we can. Let's get across the aisle, shake somebody's hand. And if we have a visitor in the house, make sure you shake their hand and tell them it's good to see them in the house of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Go 
go rise mighty river within me now to my belly praises will flow rise mighty rise mighty river within me take me to a place where pure waters go rise mighty river within me now to my my belly now to my belly places will flow now to my belly places will flow let praises flow yes Lord you Come on, ask him this morning. Rise in me, Lord. Won't you rise? Go. Rise mighty river. Come on out of my belly. Praises will flow. Come on, let praises flow in this house today. Let's worship him this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. We're going to try a new one this morning. Let's just enter into worship today. Hallelujah. Come on, God can do something great today. It's not up to Him, it's up to us this morning. He's willing, He's ready. I challenge you to press in, Lake City, press in. Press into his presence today. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. It doesn't matter how you feel this morning. It doesn't matter. He's worthy of praise. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Somebody claim that this morning.
Let's sing that one more time. Come on. Yes, Jesus. A miracle. A miracle can happen now. We'll claim it today. For the Spirit of the Lord is here. His evidence is all around. Spirit of the Lord is here. Church, worship him. Worship him right now. Thank Hallelujah. You, Thank yes, you, Lord. Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Jesus. We worship you. We worship you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Lord, in this place, fill our hearts with your love, your love surrounds us. You're the reason we came to encounter your love, your love surrounds us. Jesus this morning. Whew. We love you in this house. We can feel your presence in this place. Lord, let us never lose focus of your love. Let us never forget how you want to be with us, how you desire to be with each and every one of us in this house. God, let us continue to remember how great your presence is. Let us never get 
complacent to when you don't move. But we pray, God, that you move. And we pray that we will listen and be obedient. In Jesus' name, in Lake City PH Church said, amen, amen. Let's give the Lord some praise in this house this morning. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to ask our ushers to come down and wait upon you for the offering at this time. Do you know that giving is also worship unto the Lord? Amen. Well, a couple people believe that. Worshiping is also giving. And this morning when you give, you're not giving to the church. You're not giving to the pastors. You're giving to God himself. So this morning, say, God, place within my heart a cheerful heart to give. And as we get ready to give this morning, I want you to have that time. Let's pray together as we get ready to give to the Lord this morning. Jesus, we pray this morning that what we give you, Lord, that you will multiply so that we can see the needs of this city met by you. Lord, I pray that you are able to let us have the resources needed to let people come to know you, the lost ones that are out there that need you. Let us be a church of compassion and let us have the compassion to give. And we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Give to the Lord this morning. Can we stand together this morning and sing it one more time? In the presence. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can tell you one thing. If you can't feel the Lord in this house this morning, you need to shake yourself a little bit. Praise the Lord. You can be seated in the house. Now listen, y'all are going to have to give uh, your new executive pastor a little bit of time. I took up the offering at the wrong time. 
I was supposed to give the announcements first. That's my fault. But guess what? We're still going to do it. Amen. But we're excited. If you are a newcomer here at Lake City PH Church, we would love to meet you. If you, this is your first time or even your second time and you didn't get a chance to meet Pastor Tim or the staff, after service today, we're going to meet right down here at this first and second pew. We would love to meet with you, let you know what's going on here at the church. We have some great things set up for our new guests that are, is actually going to be starting next week. We'll let you know more about here in the next few weeks. But we would love to meet you. I want you to know something. We do not use the term visitor around here. Because a visitor just comes and visits. We believe in guests. We believe in people that will come here and be a part and become part of the family. Amen? Come on now. So if that's you, right after service, right here, we would love to see you down here, and it would be a great time. There's a few announcements this morning. We have some great things that are about to start up. Celebrate Recovery. We're about to start that up on October 4th. But this Thursday night, if you feel a heart and a call to help people that have addictions. Be here this Thursday night at 7 p.m. We're going to have a time of prayer, and we're going to have an interest meeting also at the same time. But be here this Thursday night. Who knows that we need that ministry in this area? And Lake City PH is wanting to be, come on, let's give God praise. Celebrate Recovery will be an extension of our awareness ministry that we already have. But we're going to see more ministries that come out of the awareness ministry. We're excited to get this started. If you have any questions, see Brother Gary or Brother Randall, and they'll get you caught up with anything that's going on. We are needing candy. Brother Lance told me we need some candy for our Harvest Festival. If you could bring that in and give it uh, in the lobby area or give it to Miss Jane, we will need candy for that time, and it would be appreciated if you could do that. Also, on September 20th, we have our Accelerant 2018 meeting. All youth who are interested in attending Accelerant 2018 is required. Did you hear that keyword? Required to meet in the gym Wednesday, September 20th after church. Accelerant is a great trip to the mountains. I, I get to go every year. I'm the social media director for Accelerant, so it's exciting to be able to see our youth group here being, being able to go. Now, here we have a slideshow we're going to put up uh, at this moment on September 30th, we have a huge ministry that we're so excited about doing here in this local area. We are so thankful for Sister Diane and her team that is putting together the Compassion Closet giveaway. Amen. We have many work days still left to go, and we'll let you know about those, and we'll send them out via text and put them on the Facebook uh, app as well that we have. So please make sure that you're looking for that, and we still need help. But on September 30th, that night, we're going to be giving clothes away, but we're also going to be sharing the gospel. Brother Moore Smith will be here ministering that night. You don't want to miss that night. If you can say, Pastor Mike, how can I help? Well, I would love to show you how to help. We would love to see you get connected. Actually, next Sunday night, we're going to have a time to where Pastor Tim is going to share a devotion, and we're going to actually put our hands to work. Amen? And it'll be a good time to come together. But we would love to see you. This will be on September 30th at 6 p.m. in the sanctuaries. Uh, there's no questions asked, no very verification needed. We're just giving this away and we're going to minister at the same time. If you have any questions, also you can see Sister Diane and we would love to have you here. October 1st and 2nd, Terry Tripp will be here with us in service. Amen. If you've never heard Terry Tripp, now some of you might say, how's Terry Tripp going to be here? This is Laverne's son, okay? Pastor Terry is not coming back. He, he is in heaven and he is loving his time with Jesus. This is going to be Brother Terry's son, I mean, Brother Laverne's son, Terry, and we want you to be here October 1st and 2nd. And we're excited about what God's doing. Are you excited about what God's doing here at Lake City PH? <laughs> Amen. At this time, let's welcome our pastor here this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. We have a very special guest with us today that wants to come and share. Is going to come and share for just a few minutes. But um, how many of you know that your pastor loves Holmes Bible College? I, it's, that is, um, Bishop Leggett told me, he said, I don't know why you love this place so much. I didn't attend there, but for whatever reason, God put a love in my heart. 
for homes, and we have several students that are connected to that college and are attending that college, and several that have come up through here. The, the Holmes has provided preachers for the South Carolina Conference, unlike any other um, institution there ever has been. And we're honored today to have the president of Holmes Bible College. He has a long list of other positions he's held, but at this current time, he is the president of Holmes Bible College, and we are so blessed and honored to have him, and I believe that God put all of this together, and he's going to come and share with us for a few minutes. Would you make welcome Pastor <laughs> President Chris Thompson. Thank you, Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is so good to be back in Lake City this morning and so good to be here at the church. I came to say two words to you and two words to Pastor. They're the same two words. And those two words are, thank you. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Holmes Bible College is the oldest Pentecostal school college on planet Earth. <laughs> Yay and amen. It started on Paris Mountain in 1898 as an evangelical holiness school, independent, started by a lawyer, preacher, Presbyterian. And in, in four different locations, it is now located at the foot of Paris Mountain next to Furman University, Every morning when I go into work, I can look up and see the place where it all began in 1898. We're preaching the same doctrines of salvation by faith, sanctification through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the baptism with the Holy Spirit, divine healing, second coming of the Lord, but most of all, I want to say to you about the college, we are on mission. These are crucial days. These are days in which the abnormal has become the normal. People are lost. People are floundering. People are confused. People do not know who they are, where they're going, all about their lives. Holmes Bible College is a place where young students and older students, hallelujah, can be blessed and taught and go out on mission to do the will and the work of the Lord. This church has been in the last few years so instrumental in supporting Holmes Bible College. And for the last several years, you have sent to us 7% of our enrollment for each year. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, oh. Did I say thank you? Did I say thank you? Our theme this year, he is more than enough. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. As he is, so are we. Amen. Telling you we are dedicating a new student life center on October the 5th. It is paid for. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. We are building. The flooring is going in now for a new, our first totally dedicated girl's dorm. And unless the price keeps going up, it is paid for <laughs> in Jesus' name. He is, he is more than enough. We are expecting in the spring to get close to 100 students. I am expecting next fall to go over 100 students. And so as we approach in the next few years, 
200 students at Holmes Bible College. That's 14 per year. You've got to send me to keep up with what you've been doing, Pastor. That's 14 per year. Right now, we have Joey, we have Zach, we have Jonathan, we have Noah, and Samantha as a part of our online program. And very thrilled for what you're doing. And so Betty and I are just so thrilled after many years of ministry, 49 years of preaching after I left Holmes Bible College. The queen is with me this morning. She had surgery this week, but she's with me this morning. <laughs> Hallelujah. We met there and know the best place to find a companion for the future. You're right there. You and Jonathan know it. Zoe, uh, Joey knows it, Zach. And, you know, if there are other relationships, you just bring them with you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Come on, would you give Brother Thompson another great hand clap? We are so honored. So honored to have him this morning and to have Sister Thompson as well. Like I said, he, was, he is the outgoing, just left the position as the vice chairman of our denomination and um, headed up our evangelism efforts around this country. And I think that was, that was the main area of growth in our denomination was through Acts Today. And I just thank the Lord for what he has done in that time in those eight years. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis this morning, Genesis chapter 1. If you are new to Lake City PH, I oftentimes say this before I preach, it is our custom that we get out of church about 1230. So if your mindset is we get out at 12, you are going to be very disappointed. Um, that doesn't mean that I'll preach till 1230, but um, I just don't want you to have it in your mind, oh, he's got two minutes left when I might have 32 minutes left. So, um, so I just want you to kind of get that in your, in your spirit. Take your Bible, stand to your feet, Genesis chapter 1. I'm going to be reading verses 6 and 7. I could read several verses here, but for, for sake of time, I just want to read verses 6 and 7. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters, which more under, with, which more which were under the firmament from the waters, which were above the firmament, and it was so. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that you are a God of creation. In fact, you are the God of creation, for you have created all things, and for their pleasure, and for your pleasure they are, and they were created. And God, that means I'm part of your creation, and because I'm part of your cre creation, my purpose is to bring you pleasure and Lord, I want to just let you know today, I want to say it to you before this congregation, how much I love you and respect you and honor you. You are my God. You are, the, you are the chief of my soul. And Lord, I pray today that your anointing would be on me to preach your word. For Lord, I recognize and realize that unless the anointing of God is on my heart, I cannot deliver this word. Lord, I am powerless. I will flounder at trying to do it. But God, if you touch me, your spirit can empower me to speak what needs to be spoken. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will have his way in this service today. In Jesus' In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I want you to turn to your neighbor and say this, it all begins with atmosphere. It all starts with atmosphere. Um, some time ago, we began to lay out these prayer initiatives that you see in front of you today. There are 11 of them. And um, I started with the first one. The very first prayer initiative is this one that's right here at the pulpit that simply says, Lord, we're praying that, you're, that the Lake City atmosphere, that the atmosphere that is over what we are calling the Lake City window, which is a 10-mile radius around this church, which would include the communities of Cades, of Scranton, and of Coward, and of Lake City. Lord, we are praying that this atmosphere is open and charged for you to work because it all starts with atmosphere. 
If you will notice in the time of the creation sequence, before the Lord put a bird in the sky or a fish in the sea or before he put a plant on the ground or before he put a beast in the field, he first of all dealt with atmosphere because he knew that unless he had prepared and set the atmosphere, that none of this would be able to survive. There would not be a fish that could live. There would not be a beast that could live. There would not be a bird that could live. There would not be a plant that could live. No living thing could exist unless the atmosphere had been prepared first. And as I began to prepare for this time and this season of growth, that I believe that God, even as even as Holmes Bible College is going to grow, I believe this church is going to grow in step, and we will be able to send more and more students to Bible College. We have a scholarship fund we've already created so that we can send students to Holmes Bible College, and I believe that we're going to be able to, to go in step with that. But before we do, we've got to get the atmosphere right. Before we move on to the growth and the vision that God has given us, we must get the atmosphere right. The atmosphere must be prepared in order for the Holy Spirit to move. Do we want people saved? The atmosphere has to be right. Because if the atmosphere is not right and we get them saved, they won't stay living for the Lord. Do we want them sanctified? If, if the atmosphere is not right, if once they get sanctified, they won't stay living a sanctified life. Do we want them baptized in the Holy Ghost? Do we want them healed? I want to tell you, my friend, I've come to find that God works through atmosphere. And the church must have an atmosphere for the power of the Holy Spirit to work. If you believe that, give God praise this morning. I'll tell you where the Lord really began to deal with my heart on this, on this thought of atmosphere. I was over at my dear friend, Sister Ruth's house. Sister Ruth, 91 years old, been baptized in the Holy Ghost since she was just a, a young girl. And Pastor Mike and I went to see her and the Holy Ghost fell. And after we got through with her, she said, I found a, a tape of John Kilpatrick, a CD. And I said, can I borrow that? She said, you can have it, Pastor. I put that CD in and started listening to John Kilpatrick. He was the pastor of the Great Brown revival. I pastored three miles from that church, and, and so I stuck that, that CD in, and I was listening to John Kilpatrick, and he was talking about atmosphere and how God works through atmosphere, and he was talking about the fact that the atmosphere will archive things, and he, and he related this story, and it was such a powerful story. I want to tell it to you this morning. He said he was preaching in the Appalachian Mountains. He said it was in a country church, but it was a large church, a large country church, and he said the place was packed full. In fact, there were people that were out uh, of the door. They had raised the windows uh, and people were sitting in the window sills. Uh, and he said it was the very first church that that church had ever had. Prior to that church building, they had met in brush arbors. Uh, and so he was there in this church in the Appalachians and he said he had an experience he had never had before. He was sitting on the front row of that church and he said while he was on the front row of that church he said he physically, literally could hear the sound of people crying. He said, I could hear the sounds of people praying. It was as if those windows were open and I could hear those mountains filled with the prayers of the saints. And he said they were praying things like this. They were saying, God, please don't pass our church by. God, please let our church have revival. Please let our community have revival. He said that I could hear the sound of elderly people as they prayed, Lord, save my babies. Save my my children. And he said, as I heard that sound, the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, these are the prayers of the saints that have been archived through the years. They've been bottled up before the Lord. And in that atmosphere, revival took place. You see, every prayer that has been prayed, every prayer that has been prayed in every prayer meeting that has been prayed for Lake City PH Church, going all the way back to its early history in the, in the early 1930s as that little group came together and prayed. Every prayer meeting that took place, last night at 1130, there was a group in this room praying. We prayed till after 1 o'clock this morning. Every night, every Saturday, we have people praying. Every Monday, we have people praying. I want to tell you that not just these prayer meetings, but going all the way back to the 1960s and the 1950s and the 1940s, all of these prayers that have been prayed, every one of them have been archived in the heavenlies, and we today are experiencing the power of the act 
atmosphere. That atmosphere has been prepared by the prayers of the saints and the praises of the saints. Would you give the Lord praise this morning for his power today? How many of you want people to be saved? How many of you want people to be healed? How many of you want people to be delivered and sanctified and baptized in the Holy Ghost? If we want it, then we must prepare the atmosphere. Now, when we think about the atmosphere, and we'll deal with this over the course of time, but we think about praise and worship and things of this nature, and all of that is important when it comes to atmosphere. But I want to talk to you this morning about some things that we have to do in order to prepare the atmosphere. Did you know that, as I said, I've come to find out that really God works through atmosphere more than he does through denomination. Sometimes we think, oh, God just, you know, he he has his hand just on the Pentecost Holiness Church. He loves the Pentecost Holiness Church, but he's working in the church of God. He's working in the assemblies of God. He's working in the Southern Baptist Church. He'll work in the Presbyterian Church. While he'll even work in the Methodist Church. He'll work wherever the atmosphere is set for him to work. So it's not so much about the fact that he's just partial to us because he's not a respecter of persons, but he does respect atmosphere. And so the atmosphere has to be set for the move of God to take place. I want you to go with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Did you know that even Jesus, have you ever met anybody as powerful as Jesus? Look at me. I know you're turning, but look at me. It'll be for you on the screen. Have you ever met anybody as powerful as Jesus? Have you ever met anyone that was as close to as powerful as Jesus? Do you think that we're as powerful as Jesus? Listen, if Jesus' power could have been stifled by negative atmosphere, how much more could our power be stifled by negative atmosphere? How much more could we be hindered by an atmosphere that is not set and not pronounced to, to, the, to the moving of God's Spirit? Verse 34, I'm sorry, verse 54. Matthew 13, verse 54. And when he was coming to his own country, everybody say his own country, he taught them in their synagogue in so much that they were astonished and said, now notice this, whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Verse 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brother James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Verse 37. And they were, what? Offended in him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. And look at verse 58. And he did not. Many mighty works there because of what? Their unbelief. How many of you know that if a negative atmosphere would hinder Jesus, it'll hinder us? Now, I want to show you three things this morning that the Lord showed me in this verse of Scripture about what I'm going to call the pollutants of atmosphere. Three things that will pollute the atmosphere. No matter how much we've prayed, no matter how much we've sought God, no matter how much we've cried, no matter how clean the atmosphere is, if we allow these pollutants to come into the atmosphere, they will stifle and hinder the power and presence of God from working in our atmosphere. First of all, number one, they questioned his power and his wisdom. Look at that in verse 54. Who is this man? How does he have this wisdom? How is he able to do these mighty works? Number one, they questioned his power and wisdom. Number two, notice what they said in verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? We know him. He's the carpenter's son. Why, we know his mother. Her name is Mary. We know his brethren. Joseph and, or James and Joseph and Simeon and Judah. We know all of them. Why, we even know his sisters. Let me show you the second thing. They were too familiar with Christ 
and his family. Did you know you can become too familiar with the Lord? And then thirdly, they were offended. I'm not going to have time to talk about that this morning, so I'm going to move on to verse to the first one. There are so many churches that Christ would love to demonstrate his power through, but their atmosphere is so polluted that his power is cut off. And we need to pray and praise, and we'll talk about prayer and praise more, but, but we need to first of all deal with what we can do concerning atmosphere. Number one, we must deal with our questions. We must deal with our questions. Our questions will hinder the atmosphere, so we must deal with our questions. For the most part, we as good, faith-filled Christians do not deal with questions. A good, faith-filled, loving, God-loving, God-believing person would rather walk through life. I want you to listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to slow down right here because I want you to hear what I'm saying. We would rather walk through life pretending as if we had no questions. Why, could we possibly question God? Could we possibly question God's power, God's existence, God's personage, God's plan? Could we do that? Could we possibly question him? I want to tell you, I don't know that there is a Christian on the face of the earth that has never at some point questioned why God did something the way he did it. And oftentimes that question will lead them to whether God cares about them, loves them, and watch this, if there even is a God. None of us would admit it, but sometimes even those of us that love him and serve him and walk with him and have walked with him the longest stand with questions. I don't know, I could not even begin to tell you how many funerals I've preached when I pastored in Pensacola, I preached two every single week. I had two funeral homes, one on one corner and one on the other, and they both called me and asked me to preach their funerals. I preached two every single week. I could not even tell you how many people I've buried. And I must tell you that there have been times when I stood before a casket and stood before a congregation that the old devil would come and he would say, you know, there's nothing to any of this. All these words that you're saying, all these things that you're declaring, this is just it. This body is just it. There is no heaven. There is no hell. There is no God. I, I, even as a preacher of the gospel, I have had to deal with questions. I've had to deal with those, with those thoughts that would come to my mind, those thoughts that would bombard me, especially when, when it's young people that have died or, or people that have died that were great prayer warriors and that sought God and were not healed after, like we thought they should have been healed. There have been times that, that I have had to deal with those questions. And listen, if we simply hide our questions so no one else will see our questions, we will begin to think our questions will disqualify us from service to God. But I want to tell you something. God is big enough to answer your questions. God is big enough to deal with your questions. Just because no one else knows our doubts does not mean that they do not exist. And even hidden, they will affect our atmosphere. As I said, there's not a Christian alive who has not dealt with doubt at some point in their life. But Jesus is big enough to answer your questions. And he will answer your questions if you'll simply put them before him. Many years ago when my dad was in that horrible, horrible accident that he was in and he was hit in the head by a 6,000 pound tree trunk. He laid out, you've heard me tell the story before, but he laid out on the ground, and as soon as he was hit by the tree, a man came and began to pray for him. And as he started praying for him, my dad started praying in tongues. He was totally unconscious, totally unconscious to the world. And my dad started praying in tongues, and he prayed in tongues for nine solid hours, totally unconscious. The Spirit made intercession through him for nine hours. His brain surgeon said it was the worst head injury he had ever seen in somebody live. He was in ICU for some time and went through all kinds of different um, surgeries, but his first major brain surgery that they did, they literally came through, zipped, unzipped his head, laid his, his skin back over his face, and rebuilt the bones in his head. And 
the doctors told my mom, said he has a 15% mortality rate. And when we heard that, it came crushing in on us as a family. I remember I, I got the phone call from my mother. I had been attending Lee College. I was home. I was new in the ministry. I'd only been preaching a couple of years, and I was, I was new in the ministry, not new to the Lord, but new in the ministry. And I remember I got the call when Mom said what the doctor said, and I hung the phone up, and I walked into the den of our family, of our home, and I sat there in the den, and my aunt, uh, who, is, who is my mom and dad's next-door neighbor and was a, a, a Pentecostal preacher's wife, I, she came in, and she sat with me, and I looked at her, and I said, Aunt Mary? I said, at this point, I'm not asking God to heal dad. I just want to know why. Why have we suffered like we've suffered? Why is he going through that? He's a good man. He's a godly man. He served God all of his life. Why is he going through the pain and the anguish? Why are we facing this? About that time, my mom came in the room. About that time, her husband, my uncle, came in the room. About that time, my grandmother, who was in her 80s, came in the room. And we, began, we took each other by the hand, and while we were praying, the Holy Ghost of God fell in that room. And while we were praying, we all began to speak in an unknown language. And the Holy Spirit filled that room. And when the power of God lifted up from off of us, and that anointing lifted off of us, you know what? It didn't matter why. We didn't have to have any other answer. All we knew is that we had met with God and God had met with us and his spirit and his presence was enough. I want to tell you, my friend, as long as you live in the flesh, the devil can attack your brain. He can attack your mind. He can, tell, he can cause you to question, why? Why has this happened? Is there really even a God? If there is a God, does he love me? If he does love me, does he have the power to deal with me? Does he have the power to perform? Can he bring me out? And I've come by to declare to you today, there is a God in heaven who is all-powerful. He does love you. He can perform for you and he will perform for you. The deficiency is not on the part of God. It's always on the part of man. He's big enough when you go through questions to say, God, I don't understand. But listen, you can't hide those questions and bottle those questions up. You've got to get to a place where you, where you trust God enough. That, that's really the question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? You see, your questions, your, your unanswered questions, your unspoken questions will create doubt in your heart. And that doubt and that unbelief will seep into the atmosphere. Let me ask you something. Do you still ask God to heal people when you find out they have cancer? Hmm? When you find out people have heart disease or diabetes, when you see, I tell you what, Facebook has opened the world up to how much tragedy and how much heartache there is. But when you see these things, do you still go to the Lord in prayer? Let me ask you this something. Let me ask you this question. When you pray, do you expect God to do something? Are you just praying for ritual? Are you just praying out of, out of routine? Are you just praying because somebody asked you to pray? Or do you really believe that God of heaven can heal and perform and do what he says he can do? He can. He can. We've got to start believing him for more and holding him to his promises and holding on to his promises. And then... I want to ask this question. Here, here was the second thing that came about to the children of God. Why, why this group was not able to believe God? Why they were not able to hold on to God? Why they were not able to, to, um, to experience the fullness of his power, the fullness of his presence there in Jesus' hometown? One is that they questioned his existence, who he was. They questioned his power. They questioned his wisdom. They questioned his authority. They questioned his ability. But here is one of the reasons why they questioned it. Because they had become so familiar with him. They had become so familiar with his presence. They had become so familiar with his family. And they said, is not this the carpenter's son? 
You, we know his daddy. His daddy's dead, but we knew his daddy. We know his mama. Her name is Mary. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. How in the world could this kid perform these miracles? They had become too familiar with the Lord. And as I was preparing this word, I felt the Holy Spirit speak to my heart and said, that's what's wrong with my people. They have been in church so long. They have been around preaching so long. They have been around the presence of God so long. They have been around the power of God so long that it has become second hat to them. They, they no longer are awed. They're no longer amazed at my power and my presence. There's a, a young boy by the name of Adam um, Fugan. Fugan, I believe. He's coming to preach for us in November. He's 16 years old. And he preaches like he's 60 years old. He's from North Carolina. His grandfather was a pioneer preacher in the North Carolina Conference. He lives in Wilson. And, man, I'm telling you, that kid can preach. I have video of him preaching at 13 and 14. He is one of the most powerful and dynamic young preachers I've ever heard in my life. And I, I hate to say this, but the church of God has him right now. But I'm working my best to get him back to our camp. And um, he is in a, he, they had a video of him. And the church of God highlighted him in the video. And, um, man, he was preaching good. He was preaching about the power of God and the presence of God. And I hated to tell him. I didn't say it on the, on the video, but he was preaching at a PH church. And they scanned the audience of the church. And the people were sitting there like wooden statues. It was so cold. He was preaching his little heart out. And they were sitting there as if, as if he, he could have been preaching to these pews and had just as much life as those people had. And I said, I don't understand it. How in the world are they just sitting there listening to this young boy, 14, 15 years old at that point, filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the anointing. They're just sitting there. And my wife said to me, said, well, they probably have heard all of that before. And you know what? That's true. That's true. They probably had heard before that God was bigger than anything they face. They had probably heard before that, that God could save their family and save their children. They probably had heard before that God could deliver them from alcoholism and from nicotine and from drug addiction and perversion. They probably had heard that before. They probably had heard before that God could open them up and baptize them in the Holy Ghost and cause them to speak a language they had never heard that could communicate directly to God and that could pull down the chains and the bondages of hell. They probably had heard all of that before. They probably had heard before that God had prepared a place called heaven for all those who will serve him and obey him and follow him. And they probably had heard before that God had prepared a place called hell for all of those who refused to serve him and refused to yield their life to him and refused to give him. They, he probably, they had probably heard that before. They had probably heard before that God could heal of cancer and diabetes and heart disease. They probably had heard all of that before. But here is my question. Are we not still awed by the power of the cross? Does the message that Jesus Christ hung and died at Calvary, does it not still calls us to something to arise inside of us and wake up inside of us when we hear how great and how wonderful God is? Or have we become so familiar with the power of the Holy Ghost, with the moving of the Spirit, with the working of miracles, with the gifts of the Spirit, have we become so familiar that we are not moved and awed and amazed? Let me ask you some questions this morning. Are you still grateful that he saved you? Or have you been saved so long you've become used to being saved? Have you been saved so long that somewhere you felt like you deserved to be saved? Have you walked with Christ so long that at some point you thought you and him were equals? Are you still grateful 
that he saved you? Or have you gotten over being saved? That was really great when it happened, but I've been, I've been in this old way 20 years. I've been walking this way 30 years. I've been walking this way 50 years. Are you still just as grateful that he saved you as the day you got saved? Are you still moved by the thought that souls are dying and going to hell? Does the thought that somebody is going to spend eternity separated from God in a devil's hell where a fire that cannot be quenched will burn, does that not still move you? Are you still awed, struck by the manifestation of God's power? Are you still overwhelmed by his spirit? Does powerful preaching still ignite response in your heart? Does anointed singing still bring tears to your eyes? Do you still weep when you see people go to the altar? Do you still rejoice when you hear people testify of healing? Do you still love the saints of God? Let me ask you this question. Do you still respect the preacher? Here's what it all boils down to, the last question. Do you still fear God? I'm afraid we've become so casual in the church today that we just know everybody by name. There's Joe, there's Bob, there's Luke, there's Harry, there's Larry. And we've lost a reverence for God, for his works, and for his workers. We've become so familiar with God. We've become so familiar with his works. And we've become so familiar with his workers. Let me tell you something. I seek fresh revelation of God's greatness and power regularly. In this sanctuary one week ago on Saturday night in prayer, I, I mentioned this to you on Wednesday night, but I began to see the, the magnitude of God. And as I was praying, I thought, God, I'm smaller than a gnat. And then I thought, no, a gnat's far too complicated. A gnat's far too large to compare me and you and me be the gnat. I'm smaller, th th I'm smaller than a germ. But even a germ is more complicated than I am in the face of God, in the presence of God. I'm telling you, I left the sanctuary here one week ago on, on Sunday morning about 1 o'clock. I left here with a fresh revelation of the power and the size of God. I've left here awestruck by his size. But I'm telling you something else. I'm also still awed by his works, by his power. Last Sunday morning when the Holy Spirit was flowing like he was flowing throughout this church, and, and I was standing up here, and the Holy Spirit said to me, turn around and pray for your mother-in-law. Turn around and pray for your mother-in-law. Could, she couldn't speak above a whisper. And I turned around almost half-heartedly in some ways thinking, I'm going to pray, but I'm not sure if anything's going to happen because this doesn't look like. And I felt him say, turn around and pray for her and I'll heal her. And I turned around and prayed for her. And what was it, just a few minutes, she came to the platform. She said, I can talk. We stuck her on the praise team. She finished singing the rest of the service. I'm telling you, I'm still awed by that. 
I'm still awed by what he did here. In fact, when we had Brother Abendigo, if you missed Brother Abendigo, our, our missionary evangelist to India, if you missed hearing him preach the other night, my Lord, you missed something powerful. But when he told the story of how he had strokes all night long and he prayed for three days in the hospital and walked out of the hospital, healed and still healed today, I want to tell you, my friend, I still am moved by God's wonderful works. He is a healer. He is a transformer. He is a healer. He has power. And I'm moved by his works. I'm going to tell you something else I'm still, I'm still in awe of. I'm still moved by the anointing that he has on his workers. I'm moved by his wonders, but I'm also moved by the anointing that he has on his workers. I am. I am. I'm, I'm, my wife told someone the other day, said, I come in and all Tim ever does is listen to old preachers. He just, listen to old, uh, thank God for YouTube. Man, YouTube has expanded my world. Uh, I just, I love to listen to old preachers. I, she came in the other day, she said, are you listening to that 16 year old kid again? I, I'm telling you, I'm odd by that. I'm odd by the anointing that's on people's life. Uh, I still am odd by his power and his presence that surges through his servants. I stand in awe of his anointing. Because I fear him. I fear him. Say, are you scared? I ought to be. But it's not that kind of fear. It's a, it's a reverence. It's a... I can't believe he just did that again. If we want this atmosphere... It'd be an atmosphere like we sung this morning. Blake, I love that song. Sing it every Sunday till I tell you to quit singing it. This presence of the Lord is here. The Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can happen now. I love the words. The Spirit of the Lord is here. A miracle can happen now. <laughs> because until his manifested presence came in this room, there weren't no miracles that were going to take place. Until his manifested presence got here, nobody was going to get saved. Until his manifested presence came here, nobody was going to be delivered. Until his manifested presence got here, nobody was going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But his presence is here, and a miracle can happen now. Would you stand to your feet and give the Lord praise this morning? Come on, put your hands together and praise him this morning. Come on, praise him this morning. Guys, I'm still awed by the anointing that's on your life. I still stand amazed when I hear you guys preach and declare the word of the Lord. Anointed preaching still incites response for me. <laughs> Brother Bishop, President, Pastor, there's so oftentimes I don't hear much anointed preaching that when I do hear it, I still stand amazed at the way God is moving in the life of the anointed. I don't ever want to become so familiar with my bishop that I call him Greg. I don't ever want to become so familiar with the, with the people that God has put over me that I feel like I can just call them by their first name. Say, preacher, you're making a big deal. No, I, I want to tell you something. I still respect the authority that God has placed over me. I still respect because I fear God. I, I don't ever want to become so familiar with his workers or his works that he can't do many mighty works. Blake, can we come back and sing that song again? Come on, praise team. Hallelujah. Would you take each other by the hand and let's just begin to pray. I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Jesus, if there are any pollutants 
that is in my life. Lord, if I question you, if I question your power, if I question your purpose, if I question your existence, if I question your authority, Lord, forgive me and answer my questions. Show me your power. Show me your spirit. Show me your glory. And Lord, if I become too familiar with the power of God and the presence of God and the preaching of God, I ask you today to put a fresh awe, put fresh amazement, put fresh energy, put fresh enthusiasm in my heart for the things of God. Set this atmosphere for your power to move, for your spirit to be demonstrated in Jesus' name. I want to give you this word of instruction. I could call you to the altar and that would be fine and in place, but this is what I feel the Spirit of the Lord is saying to me. 
tell them to go home and begin to create atmosphere in their own house. Tell them to go home and to begin to pray and to begin to praise and to begin to deal with the pollutants in their house. If you have questions, bring them to the Lord. Bring them to the Lord. Listen, you can bring them to me. I'm fine with that. Say, preacher, I don't understand. I don't understand this. I had someone come to the other, the other day, and they had some questions, some questions about hell, some questions about homosexuality. They, they came and brought them to me, and I, and I did my best to answer those questions from the Bible. It is not a crime to have questions. You can come to me and ask questions. The, 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 the bad part is when you keep them bottled up inside, and they roll over in your mind, and they create doubt. So come with your questions. Get them out of your mind. And then secondly, look in your home and say, God, have I become too familiar with your presence? Have I become too familiar with your power? Have I become too familiar with the word of God that it no longer awes me, that it no longer amazes me, that it no longer thrills me? Because I'm going to tell you, if we're too familiar that, that he, he, he's just Jesus, that's just the carpenter's son. Oh, that's just Mary, and you know, that's we know his brothers and we know his sister. If we become too familiar with him, with his works and his workers, we'll lose the awe that we need to have for the presence of God and the atmosphere to be. So I want you to go home today and I want you to begin to set the atmosphere in your own home. And if you will, God will work, miracles will happen in your home. Miracles will happen in your home. Salvation will take place in your home if you'll do that. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Would you give the Lord another hand clap of praise this morning? By the close of this prayer, I will have let you out six minutes early. Amen. So come back tonight. We just want to remind everybody after the prayer, if you are a first-time guest today, we would love to meet you down here. If this is your second time and we didn't get to see you, we would love to see you. We as a church are going to be intentional about meeting our new guests. Amen? Because you're that important to us. Let's pray and let's ask God to move today as we get ready to go out and just we thank God for what he's going to do. Jesus, we love the atmosphere of what you've done here in this church. We thank you for how you've moved in this house. Let us never become complacent. Let us take this home with us. Let us take it to our jobs with us. Let us have a spirit of who you are around us at all times, no matter where we walk into, no matter who we interact with. God, I pray that today that we realize that we truly can have a joy with our salvation again. And God, let us be able to do that and mark the people of Lake City PH to be known to be different and peculiar to change people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. If you're brand new, we would love to see you.